You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. So I thought we'd start today's podcast with a fairly simple history question. Just who was the first man to fly an airplane nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean? Well, most people would respond with Charles Lindbergh, who definitely did fly from New York to Paris starting on May 20th of 1927. But being a teacher, I'd only give you half credit for that answer. That's because Lindbergh was the first to fly an airplane solo across the Atlantic, but he was not the first to do so. Now, the thought of flying over the Atlantic goes back to the beginning of flight itself. That's with the invention of hot air balloons. In 1859, Philadelphia native John Wise made the first attempt in an enormous balloon that he named the Atlantic. Unfortunately, he never did cross the Atlantic. That flight ended with a crash landing in Henderson, New York. Few people know this, but the first to fly over the Atlantic were British aviators John Alcock and Arthur Brown. Taking off from St. John's, Newfoundland on June 14, 1919, the two flew nonstop across the Atlantic and landed 16 hours later in the coastal town of Clifton, Ireland. Although they flew a far shorter distance than Lucky Lindy, they do get the nod for being the first to ever do so. Two years after Lindbergh's successful flight, three men decided that they would become the first Frenchmen to fly across the Atlantic. They planned to do so in a yellow Bernard 191 monoplane that they named the well, I'm going to mispronounce it, so I'll have my wife jump in here. L'oiseau canari. That's far better than anything I could have said. Anyway, it simply means canary bird. But somehow, when it got translated to English, they called it the yellow bird instead. Funding for the flight was provided by Armand Latte Jr., who was the only child of wealthy French hoteliers. He hired Jean Ocelant as the pilot and René Lefebvre as the navigator. Now Lottie had to settle for being co-pilot of the Yellow Bird since he had been partially blinded in his right eye in an earlier hunting accident. While these three men may have dreamed of crossing the Atlantic in the Yellow Bird, the French government had a totally different idea. They placed a major obstacle in their way. That's because due to the great danger of transatlantic flights in the 1920s, the French had banned anyone from attempting to do so. But there was one very big hole in this ruling, and the Yellowbirds team opted to take full advantage of it. Their thinking was that while a French could forbid a plane from leaving French soil to fly over the Atlantic, there was very little they could do to stop a transatlantic flight from landing on French soil. Basically, just go the other way. So, they secretly flew the Yellow Bird to England, disassembled the plane, and then they proceeded to crate it up for shipment aboard the SS Leviathan, and they sent it off to the United States. To mark the second anniversary of Lindbergh's historic flight, they chose the same exact date and airport. The Yellow Bird would fly out of Roosevelt Field on Long Island on May 29th of 1929. Unfortunately, that commemorative flight would never happen. That's because the weather at Roosevelt Field was awful and the runway just turned into a soggy mush. Keep in mind, this is in the days before paved runways. You see, the plane would be so heavy when loaded with enough fuel to cross the full expanse of the ocean that it was just certain to sink into the mud. On May 23rd, the decision was made to move the Yellow Bird to Old Orchard Beach in Maine. This location was thought to be better suited for the transoceanic flight, not only because the beach was made from firmly compact sand, which of course drains well, but the old orchard runway length was approximately 50% longer than at Roosevelt Field. At Old Orchard Beach, the Yellow Bird would not be the only airplane attempting to cross the Atlantic. There they met up with the Green Flash. Another monoplane which was piloted by Americans Roger Q. Williams and navigated by Louis A. Yancey. They were already there awaiting clearance to fly off for Rome. 
Captain Yancey made it clear that the arrival of the Yellowbird would not hinder their plans in the least. Quote, We will wait for no one. We have a job to do. This was the start of what was referred to as the first transatlantic airplane race. Could the American team beat the French team across the ocean? Would the smaller and more nimble green flash be able to outmaneuver the yellow bird? Or would the more powerful engine aboard the French aircraft offer its superior air power? The press did their best to promote this as a competition, but unfortunately the pilots themselves saw it more as a friendly rivalry. All of those involved were incredibly cordial to one another. They even dined and socialized together, and they helped the opposing team work on their flying machines. Well, Mother Nature turned out to be no more cooperative up in Maine than she was down in New York. You see, flying long distance was so incredibly risky in the 1920s that the weather didn't simply need to be excellent in Maine. It needed to be relatively clear and calm across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Of course, that's something that doesn't happen very often. On Friday, May 24th, both planes were placed in the hangar at Buzzard Airport, and they just basically sat there awaiting clearance from the weather services. The planes were still grounded on Sunday, but it was agreed upon that the green flash would take off from the beach first. Then, 15 minutes later, the yellow bird would follow behind. The logic behind this decision was that the yellow bird's more powerful engine would allow it to attain a greater flight speed, and then, of course, it would overtake the green flash at about 75 miles or 120 kilometers out. At that point, the two would fly alongside a Coast Guard plane for the first hour before their escort was forced to turn back. Finally, the decision was made for both planes to take off on Wednesday, May 29th. It was just one of those days where nothing seemed to go right. And for some unknown reason, it was decided at the last moment that the yellow bird would go first. So a towing car pulled the airplane along the beach, but the yellow bird barely got off the ground. It just seemed to lack oomph that day. At 12,700 pounds, or 5,760 kilograms, the plane just didn't seem to have enough lift. In fact, one of its wheels on its landing gear scraped the top of a wave as it went by. But very slowly, the yellow bird gained altitude, and the Coast Guard amphibious plane fell in behind it. At approximately 9 miles, or 14.5 kilometers out, the French plane crossed Cape Elizabeth, and suddenly its engine began to sputter, and the aircraft lost altitude. So the Coast Guard pilot prepared to rescue the crew members when the plane hit the water. So he reached for his emergency equipment, and you're going to laugh at this. His emergency equipment consisted of nothing more than an axe, which he could use to chop a hole into the Yellow Bird's fuselage when it hit the water. And of course, he also radioed all nearby Coast Guard vessels to race to the rescue. Luckily, aboard the Yellow Bird, co-pilot Armin Lottie noticed a plummeting fuel gauge, and he made the quick decision to lighten its load by dumping 500 gallons, it's about 1,900 liters, of fuel into the sea. The Yellow Bird then quickly rose back up into the air, and they limped it safely back to Old Orchard Beach. It was later determined that this near disaster was all Lottie's fault to begin with. You see, while the yellow bird was sitting on the beach, he inserted a rag into its air intake, and that was to prevent sand from getting into the engine. When they were cleared for flight, Lottie forgot to remove the rag, so it was sucked into the engine's carburetor, and this excessive engine vibration ultimately caused the gasoline tank to leak. As for the green flash, it didn't fare much better. Six minutes after the yellow bird took off, the green flash made its way down the sandy runway. Suddenly, the plane hit a soft spot in the sand and it just spun into a ground loop. Neither pilot Williams or navigator Yancey were injured in the slightest, but three spokes on one of the wheels were severely damaged. A replacement wheel was barred from another plane and the green flash was once again ready for flight the next day. With both planes repaired and ready to go, the New York Weather Bureau provided more bad news on May 30th. 
A major storm with gale force winds was sweeping northward across the Azores and would pass directly through their proposed flight path. Now the earliest that they could possibly fly again would be Saturday, June 8th. Keep in mind they got there on May 23rd. The two teams use their idle time to both tweak their aircraft and of course take them out on short practice flights. At 10 p.m. on June 5th, night watchmen guarding the two airplanes made an emergency call to the Brunswick Hotel. That's where the crews of the two planes were staying, but they were unable to locate either. The planes, it turns out, had been left out on the beach overnight, and while everyone seemed to be paying attention to the weather, no one seemed to have been paying attention to the effects of the sun and the moon. An unusually high tide pushed the ocean water an estimated 60 feet or 18 meters farther up the beach than typical. The wheels of the yellow bird became submerged and the call was made out for anyone who could help to move the two airplanes to higher ground. Firemen, reporters, just about anyone who's available to help attach ropes and they pulled the two planes to safety. As you'll probably guess, the predicted departure date of Saturday, June 8th just came and went. Once again, the weather was not suitable for flight. Then, on June 9th, it was announced in the press that the French Air Ministry had not approved the transatlantic flight of the Yellowbird, claiming that the plane lacked sufficient lifting power. Of course, the crew knew this the whole time. They said that no airplane of its size had ever lifted off with such a heavy weight, so French officials had good reason, of course, to reject their planned flight. Pilot Jean Ocelant responded to this concern by pointing out that the Yellow Bird had already lifted this weight, and that was with a cloth clog carburetor. He added, quote, If we make it, all will be forgiven. The next day, 23-year-old Ocelant would be in the news for a totally different reason. On June 10th, he wed 22-year-old New York City showgirl Pauline Parker. Now, the law required that the couple wait five days after filing a marriage application, but the rule was waived in this case by Judge Carol S. Chaplin in probate court. At this point in the story, you're probably wondering if either plane will ever take off. Well, I've got bad news for you. The weather still hasn't cleared and both planes are still sitting on the beach after all these years. Ah, Just kidding. On the morning of Thursday, June 13th, hundreds of spectators watched as the Yellowbird finally lifted off on its long flight to Paris. The takeoff was broadcast on 140 radio stations coast to coast via the national broadcasting system, which most people know as NBC today. From the south end of the beach, Captain C.E. Fogg announced to listeners, quote, Both planes are ready. There's a big crowd here and it's growing larger. The mechanics are busy over the planes, around them and under them, and each plane is surrounded by the shifting group of the curious. After a brief interruption by the sound of the motor, announcer Fogg continued, They have started the engine of the Yellow Bird, and now I'll shift you to the north end of the beach. Listeners were now switched over to the voice of L.P. Pittman. Quote, the Bernard is coming this way, its engines running and towed as well. The green flash is also moving up. From here they seem to be moving very slowly. Now they're turning the yellow bird around. After a brief description of the sky and beach conditions, Pittman continued, Here she comes, the yellow bird, and she's coming fast. She's a mile away. Here she is. The yellow bird then roared on by, and the broadcast switched to the reporter farther down the beach. Here she comes. Here she comes like the wind. It's the yellow bird. She's trying to get off. She's flying five feet, ten feet off the sands. The pilot is turning. They have splashed just before she got off. He continued, Aslan has turned her out to sea toward the east. The plane is climbing slowly but steadily. He's fifty feet up now, perhaps a hundred, and a couple of miles away. He's flying beautifully. At this point, the broadcast has turned over to Ralph Dakota. He was the chief radio officer on the Coast Guard's Lenny Amphibious biplane, and it was flying at approximately 1,000 feet or 305 meters above the yellow bird. Quote, She looks pretty, that yellow bird. We are right over her. She shows up pretty against the blue water. She's still climbing and going fast, going fast from us into the east. 
She must have nearly a thousand feet now. How fast she flies. Aslan is pulling her steadily into the east and flying well. He continued, We are 20 miles out and she is getting away from us. She must be 10 miles away now and still climbing. She's going fast and she's awfully pretty against the water. We can't go much further, but the yellow bird is keeping on. She's almost out of sight and apparently still climbing. She's getting smaller and we're turning back. The water looks pretty rough down there. Dakota concludes with, It's getting hazy and the yellow bird has gone. She's gone now and we're going back. At this point, the radio broadcast switches back to the reporters on the beach. Here comes the green flash. She's picking up speed. Williams has the tail up. She's coming faster, 60, 70 miles an hour. In an instant, the tone of the broadcast changes. Something's happened. I can't see from here, but she seems to turn and go over on her nose. She seems to have crashed on the edge of the water. I'll try to find out. They're nearly a mile from here, but it looks like a bad mess, a bad wreck. If you'd like to see for yourself what happened, there's a silent newsreel of the accident on the website criticalpass.com and I'll put a link to this on my website. In the footage, the plane can be seen picking up speed as it rolls down the sandy runway, and then suddenly, way out in the far distance of the camera shot, you can see its right wheel collapse, and then the plane just begins to tumble over upon itself. When the violent flip ended, the green flash's propeller had been snapped, its left wing was badly torn, the fuselage dented, its landing gear virtually destroyed, and I have to admit, the engine looked quite mangled up. So that great transatlantic airplane race had now officially come to an end with only the yellow bird starting on its planned journey. Now that it's off the ground, the question was whether or not the plane could really make it. And that's because weight was everything in the early days of flying. Even today, the heavier the plane, the more fuel it's consumed. Now, the crew of the Yellow Bird have been very careful in their planning so that the plane would be as lightweight as possible. This included co-pilot Lottie's decision to remove the plane's life raft. Instead, he opted for two automobile inner tubes which could be used as life preservers. And then, pilot Oslin ordered that 100 gallons or 378 liters of fuel be removed to lighten the load which of course made it all that much more risky that their engine would conk out before reaching the European coast. They even took minimal amounts of food, supposedly just a dozen each of both oranges and bananas, a half dozen lemons, plus three quarts of water and three quarts of coffee. And we can probably guess a little bit of alcohol also. Oddly, the one thing that they did take with them was their mascot Rufus, who just happened to be an 8-inch or 20-centimeter long alligator, which had been presented to the crew by Portland resident A.W. Foss. Within minutes of the Yellow Bird's launch, a rumor began to spread across Old Orchard Beach that there may be a problem which could potentially doom the flight. Spectators reported seeing a teenager climb through a hatch in the tail of the plane, while the French flyers were having their photographs taken up front just prior to takeoff. Several identified the possible stowaway as 18-year-old Portland resident Alan Jordan, but it was later determined that he could not be the person on the plane if in fact there ever was one. No one could say for sure if this rumor was true or not. If so, the added weight could cause the airplane to burn through its fuel more rapidly and of course leave it short of its goal. The Yellow Bird was still within range to turn back or report any problems by radio, but the crew had not done so. It was argued by experts that a stowaway was nearly impossible because there was very little room on the plane for additional supplies, never mind an entire human being. Yet, some said this may be the reason why the Yellow Bird's tail seemed to drag just a bit during takeoff. Later in the afternoon, there seemed to be fairly conclusive evidence that someone did indeed hide inside the tail of the plane. Mrs. Morris Schreiber told the press that her 22-year-old son Arthur had left their Portland home, which was located at 526 Washington Avenue. He had left the evening before the launch, and he was dressed in khaki pants and a leather flight jacket. 
The clothes had been given to him by his older brother, who had served as a pilot during World War I. Just hours after the yellow bird took off, J. Wilbur Clark, who was one of Arthur Schreiber's friends, called his family and told them that their son had wanted to accompany the Green Flash on its flight to Rome. But upon realizing that the plane was too small, he opted to jump aboard the larger yellow bird. Clark said, quote, When the plane was ready to go, I rapped near the tail and a rap came back, showing that Schreiber was aboard at takeoff. Arthur left the following note for his parents. Dear parents, I'm attempting to go on the airship Green Flash. If I succeed in getting on, do not worry for me. I am doing this thing on my own accord and was not influenced by anyone and wish no one to be held responsible for the consequences. He continued, I am doing it because I know that if I succeed, I can do much for your happiness. Please do not think bad of me. I will cable you if I arrive in Rome. I am constantly thinking of you. Love, Arthur. This seemed to give credence to the stowaway theory, but of course it was not conclusive. You know, this letter could have been a hoax, and it was hard to imagine that anyone could hide in the belly of such a small plane and not be noticed. Now, the plane did have one storage closet in the rear of the plane, but this is where the rubber life raft was stored. Oh, wait, that was removed from the plane just prior to flight. Hmm. Stowaway or not, the press reported the plane's progress as it crossed the Atlantic. At 10.15 a.m., the Yellow Bird was sighted passing over Matinicus Rock in Maine. At 5.40 p.m., the SS Whitefeld reported that it had spotted the plane approximately 850 miles, or 1,370 kilometers, from the eastern coast of the United States. At 7.30 p.m., the Yellow Bird advised the SS Rochambeau that they had changed course and planned to fly by way of the Azores and the Portuguese coast. That added 600 miles, or 965 kilometers, to its flight path. At 11 p.m., communication with the SS American Farmer confirmed that all was going well. At 1 a.m., that's Friday morning, the SS King City communicated with the Yellow Bird, and at 6 a.m., the crew of the Yellow Bird contacted the SS Niagara when it was approximately 800 miles, or a little under 1,300 kilometers, from the Portuguese coast. At 11.30 a.m., the plane was about halfway between the Azores and Portugal. That's when radio operators in Bordeaux intercepted a message from pilot Ocelant. He expressed concern over strong headwinds that were rapidly causing their fuel supply to dwindle. At 1.40 p.m., the Yellow Bird was 200 miles or 320 kilometers from the Portuguese coastline. Upon reaching Europe, the Yellow Bird was running dangerously low on fuel. The plane traveled northward, closely following the shoreline in search of a place to land. At first, nothing seemed suitable until a wide-level beach was spotted near Comilla, Spain, and the plane was brought down safely. The Yellow Bird became the 11th plane to fly nonstop across the Atlantic, and of course it was the first done by a French crew. They set a new record average speed at 105 miles per hour, or 169 kilometers per hour. The 3,128-mile flight, which is a little over 5,000 kilometers, was the longest flown over the ocean up to that point, and it had taken them 29 hours and 52 minutes to complete. The French crew had landed about 160 miles, or 257 kilometers, from the border of France, so you can imagine their disappointment when they later learned that they had about 300 liters of fuel remaining. That was enough for three additional hours of flight, which of course would have placed them onto their native soil. Just coincidentally, the crew of the Green Flash, that's Yancey and Williams, they would successfully leave Old Orchard Beach on July 8, 1929. Of course, with the Green Flash out of commission, they had to get another plane, so they flew the Pathfinder and they encountered the same strong headwinds that the Yellow Bird did. Once again, they were low on fuel, so they had no choice but to land the plane on the same exact beach in Spain. Of course, there's still one really big question to be answered. Was Arthur Schreiber on board the Yellow Bird? 
Well, the answer to that question became really obvious when four men, not three, emerged from the plane's fuselage. During a 1966 interview, Schreiber described what had happened. The day before the flight, he had accompanied some friends to view the planes at Old Orchard Beach, and one of them bet that none would have the guts to take such a flight, so of course Arthur decided to take that dare. He raced home, put on his brother's flight suit, and returned to the beach to help load the airplanes with fuel and supplies. His plan was to fly on the green flash, but the pilot said that there wasn't room for him. The next morning, as volunteers helped push the yellow bird into position for takeoff, Art pushed on a door handle for leverage, which caused it to turn and open a hatch. It was at that moment that he hopped into the plane, and he looked around for a place to hide, but could only find two places to do so. One, of course, was the life raft compartment, and the other housed the airplane's control cables. He opted for the latter, placing himself inside the compartment in such a position so that he wouldn't touch the cables. Quote, I found that I could squat with two wires between my legs and with two others under my arms. I thought that I'd be able to hold that position for quite a while. Clearly, he wasn't anticipating a 30-hour flight. About 20 minutes into the flight, Art decided it was time to make his presence known. Quote, because I had no experience, I thought it was still on the ground warming up the engines. So I thought this was adventure enough and that I could get out while I could. He continued, When I crept forward through the second door, there was the navigator, Armin Lottie Jr., with his back to me. He couldn't hear me because of the terrible noise of the engines. I opened the hatch to jump out and was aghast to see nothing but ocean below. Well, there was nothing else to do. I had to present myself. Lottie was very surprised when I tapped him lightly on the shoulder. Shortly after the plane had made its successful landing in Spain, Asalan told the INS, that's the independent news service, that, quote, The tail of the plane felt unusually heavy, and I found that I had to get the motor roaring at full speed before the plane could leave the ground. The trouble mystified me considerably, but I was determined to keep on if possible. About 20 minutes after we had left Old Orchard Beach behind us, I was amazed to see a man crawl from the tail of the plane where he had hidden himself before takeoff. He continued, My first feeling was of utmost anger, and I felt like throwing him overboard into the Atlantic. Lottie told the New York Times, quote, We looked at him and realized that it was he who had added the weight to the yellow bird, and our feelings, well, they weren't precisely friendly. He added, he made himself useful for the rest of the trip, and now we count him as one of us. Lottie also described a harrowing incident that occurred about five hours into the flight. For the first two hours, their fuel came from storage tanks in the wings, and then they switched to their reserve tanks, which they anticipated would last another four hours. Their flight nearly came to an end when those reserve tanks emptied sooner than was expected and the motor just suddenly stopped. The Fivre and Lottie raced to open the valves to another fuel tank and luckily the momentum of the propeller had kept it spinning and as soon as the first drops of fuel entered the combustion chamber, the motor just roared back to life. As the plane sat on the beach in Spain, mechanics worked to get it tuned up so that the yellow bird could be flown back to France. The biggest problem was that the beach at Comillas could not handle the weight of the plane when it was loaded with fuel, so a pit stop would need to be made along the way. On Sunday, June 16, 1929, the yellow bird took off once again, first landing at Mimisa Le Bas to refuel and then touching down for good in Le Bourget at 8.47 p.m. The aircraft carried not just the original crew three, but also the stowaway Schreiber and their mascot Rufus. All received international press coverage, but Arthur Schreiber was now a celebrity. Anticipating this would occur, Lottie said, quote, I made Schreiber sign a rude contract aboard the plane, providing a 50-50 split of all newspaper earnings with Asselant and the Führer. 
What is most surprising was that the Yellow Bird's crew never blamed Schreiber for their failure to reach French soil. While his added weight may have played a small part, they attributed their inability to do so on a strong headwind that slowed the plane down, and of course being slightly off course when they landed. After landing at Les Bourget, Lottie was quoted as saying, We thought we were over France when we landed. He added, We were most surprised when the first men we met spoke no French. While in Paris, all four men attended banquets and celebrations. And since Schreiber had no place to stay, Lottie's father put him up free of charge in his hotel. Then on Thursday, June 20th, Arthur Schreiber boarded the SS Leviathan, that's the same liner that had brought the Yellow Bird to the United States, and he set sail for home. A newspaper syndicate paid him $2,500, that's about $35,000 today, for his story, and he used his advance to pay for his ticket home. And as agreed, the remainder of the money was split with the crew of the Yellow Bird. Back home in the United States, Arthur was made out to be a hero, while the French press just wasn't as kind. Supposedly the word imbecile was printed most frequently. Schreiber responded to this criticism by stating, quote, Well, perhaps they are right. I did not consider the seriousness of the situation. I only went for the thrill. I do not regard myself as a hero and never made such an absurd statement that my ambition was to become the second Lindbergh. I only did what I think the average American boy would have done if he had had the opportunity. On July 15th, it was announced in Billboard magazine that Arthur Schreiber had been signed by Burt Jones in New York to manage his career in vaudeville. It was never to be, though. On September 23rd, Arthur was critically injured in Newburyport, Massachusetts, while he was traveling as a passenger in a car owned by his father, but driven by 25-year-old Maurice Stress. Schreiber did recover, only to crash his car into another on December 29th in Providence, Rhode Island. He was charged with driving in a reckless manner and had his driver's license temporarily suspended. Fast forward to Thursday, June 11, 1959. That's when Schreiber received a surprise phone call from René Lefebvre, who is now an executive at Air France. With the 30th anniversary of the Yellow Bird's historic flight just a couple of days away, Air France decided to give Arthur a four-day, all-expense-paid trip to Paris to celebrate. Oddly, Schreiber was being honored not for being a flying hobo, but for being the world's first paid transatlantic airplane passenger. It seems when he split the, you know, the earnings with everyone, he had paid for his flight. He was assured that co-pilot Lottie would also be there, but sadly, pilot Jean Ocelon had died when his plane was shot down by enemy aircraft on May 7, 1942. After his 15 minutes of fame subsided, Arthur moved around a bit, married twice, and ultimately became a dog warden in California. He retired from the California National Guard on February 10, 1967, after 41 years of military service. He died in Oxford, California on February 10, 1997, which just happened to be his 90th birthday. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. Northwest Orient. <laughs> If you're planning a trip to Seattle or Portland, plan to fly Northwest Orient. Ask for a reservation on the flight that leaves Dulles International every evening at 6.15. And it'll take you non-stop right to Seattle. You'll arrive there at 8.30 their time. And on the way, on the way you just relax and enjoy one of the lavish full-course dinners that Northwest is known for. From Seattle, this flight continues on to Portland, arriving there before 10 o'clock. For reservations to the Pacific Northwest any evening at 6.15, just uh, see your travel agent or call Northwest Orient. That radio commercial for Northwest Orient Airlines aired in 1970. It is part of the classic airliners and vintage pop culture collection of videos on YouTube. Colonel Lewis Hotchess Britain formed Northwest Airways on September 1st, 1926. 
Since passenger flight was still in its infancy, Northwest's focus was on hauling mail between Minneapolis and Chicago. Passenger flights began on July 5, 1927, when pilot Charles Speed Holman transported two passengers to Chicago. A total of 106 passengers were carried during that first year. On April 16, 1934, the company officially changed its name to Northwest Airlines Incorporated and introduced service to East Coast destinations. In 1931, Northwest sponsored Charles and Ann Lindbergh on a test flight to Japan via Alaska, tracing out the Great Circle route over the Pacific. They used this route to deliver soldiers and cargo to the Aleutian Islands, Canada, and Alaska during World War II. Once the war was over, Northwest began direct scheduled service between the United States and Tokyo. Flights were soon added to Seoul, Manila, and Hong Kong, so the company started advertising under the moniker Northwest Oriented Airlines, even though it never really changed its name from Northwest Airlines. On April 14, 2008, Northwest Airlines was merged into Delta Airlines. In 2010, the Northwest name had been completely phased out. So here's a question for you. For many years after the Wright brothers made the first powered flight on December 17, 1903 at Kitty Hawk, airplanes were mostly experimental and designed to push boundaries. But clearly at some point, someone came up with the bright idea of charging passengers to fly. Do you know when the first commercial airline was started? If you can get within five years of the actual value, I will consider you to be correct. So hang around for a few minutes and I'll let you know the answer to this question. In other news, here are a few stories from the past that all have something to do with today's topic, flight. When Lieutenant Louis J. Connors was given the okay by the control tower operator in Chicago on April 30th, 1938 to take off in his Army BY-9 monoplane, nothing initially seemed out of the ordinary. That was until the air traffic controller noticed something attached to the outside of the plane. No, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. So he grabbed some binoculars. Yeah, he wasn't crazy. There was a man clinging to the outside of the plane as it approached nearly 1,000 feet or a third of a kilometer in altitude. He frantically radioed Lieutenant Connors, quote, You have a passenger astride the fuselage. Please set down. Connors immediately circled the aircraft around and made a smooth landing. And that's when Private First Class Frank H. Krebs let go of the airplane and fell to the ground, his fingers white from the firm grip that he had on the smooth fuselage. Krebs summarized for the press what had happened. Quote, There was a passenger on that ship headed for St. Louis. He had forgotten to sign the required papers releasing the Army from responsibility during the flight. I grabbed the releases and ran for the plane. I just stepped on the wing when the control tower gave Lieutenant Connors the signal to take off. I was too startled to jump until too late. My one chance was to slide onto the fuselage. I did that and I'll bet no cowpuncher ever rode a Bronco with more determination. Next time I hope they'll give me a saddle. On May 14, 1956, Airman 3rd Class Fred E. Higginbotham was working with his fellow Air Force crew to refuel an F-86F Sabre jet on the island of Okinawa in Japan. Their goal was to move quickly and get the jet back into the air as soon as possible. Higginbotham's job was to secure a static line cable onto the nose gear of the plane as soon as it came to a stop. This line prevented the buildup of static electricity, which of course could produce sparks and potentially ignite the fumes that were produced during the refueling process. Now, the Air Force did have strict rules in place that prohibited anyone from getting too close to the intake duct of the fighter jet's engine. And since this was their last servicing job for the day, the crew was anxious to get the job done. As part of the post-flight procedure, the pilot advanced the throttle to 65% power, which he was supposed to do for a period of two minutes before shutting the engine down. 
Just as this was happening, Higginbotham felt the tug of the jet's intake on his back, but he continued to hold on to that static cable. He didn't realize it at the time, but he had gotten too close to the engine's intake. Then suddenly his hat was pulled off his head and Higginbotham instinctively turned around to grab it. The next thing you know, he was flying through the air and was sucked right into the jet engine. One would have expected Higginbotham to have been torn to shreds by the blades of the engine, but that didn't happen. Instead, he was stopped by the engine's power takeoff case cover, which projected outward from the blades in a cone shape. He used all his might to keep away from the whirling blades, which were just 6 inches or 15 centimeters from his head. About 30 seconds after the pilot advanced the throttle, he felt a bump in the engine's operation. He also spotted a mechanic frantically waving a rag in the air to get his attention. Well, that worked. The pilot immediately cut power to the engine and the rotors began to slow down. Just as Higginbotham started to back out of the engine, someone grabbed his legs and pulled him out of the engine completely. Amazingly, he still had that static cable in his hands, although it was wrapped twice both around his waist and his legs. Later investigation determined that the cable had become fully extended when Higginbotham was sucked into the engine, and it most likely saved his life. Higginbotham's injuries were minor. He had some cable burns and minor abrasions, but that's about it. He was released from the hospital and was back on the job the very next day. And lastly, on June 13, 1963, comedian Milton Berle was performing in a Houston, Texas nightclub when he decided to introduce astronaut Lieutenant Commander Jerry Clayton to his audience. Now, perhaps you've never heard of an astronaut named Jerry Clayton. Well, you're not alone. Neither had the four other astronauts or the NASA public affairs officer who were also seated in the audience that night. They quickly pointed out that Clayton was an imposter. 28-year-old Jerry G. Tees was arrested and charged with impersonating an officer for credit purposes since he had obtained credit at a cafe. Bail was set at $5,000, which is about $40,000 today. It turns out that Tease had been impersonating an astronaut for about a month and had used it to his advantage. He was given food and drink, taken on fishing trips. He was even offered cars, boats, and jobs. Over the previous 10 years, he had impersonated other military officers, doctors, and businessmen. He was quoted as saying, I don't know why I do it. He added, I just live in a dream world, I guess. So a few minutes ago, I'd asked you when the first commercial airline was established. Do you think you know the answer? Well, it was January 1st of 1914. Now, the idea for the first airline came from the mind of Percival Elliott Fanzler. Fanzler was the sales manager for the Jacksonville branch of a tractor company when he came across an article describing a 1912 long-distance flight from Omaha to New Orleans. In the story, the airplane's designer, that's Thomas W. Benoit, he discussed the potential cost of carrying packages, mail, and passengers. Fans are noted that the numbers that Benoit was quoting were very competitive with the rates that railroads were charging, and he decided to contact Benoit to discuss the possibility of setting up a scheduled airline service. The two men got together and decided there needed to be a, quote, real commercial line from somewhere to somewhere else. And just where would that somewhere and somewhere else be? Well, Fanzler had the answer, St. Petersburg and Tampa, Florida. Now, the two cities are fairly close to one another, but since St. Petersburg sits on a peninsula located between Tampa and the Gulf of Mexico, travel between the two locales in the early part of the 20th century took quite some time. Your best bet would have been a two-hour steamboat ride across the bay or a five-hour trip by train. With automobiles still in their infancy, a trip by car on primitive roads was estimated to take nearly an entire day. So he thought, what if you could fly across the channel in far less time? 
Together, these two aviation pioneers started the St. Petersburg-Tampa airboat line. The city of St. Petersburg agreed to contribute $40 per day for a period of three months as long as the airline flew two flights every weekday, whether they had a paid passenger or not. The contract with the city was signed on December 17, 1913, which just happened to be the 10th anniversary of the Wright brothers' historic flight. Benoit hired flight pioneer Tony Janis to pilot the plane across the bay. Then, an auction was held for the first round-trip ticket, and the winner, that was former St. Petersburg Mayor Abram C. File. He paid $400, which would be about $9,700 today, for the privilege of becoming the first paid commercial flight passenger. Word quickly spread of the planned flight, and on the morning of January 1, 1914, a crowd of more than 3,000 people gathered on the beach in St. Petersburg. That's actually near the present location of the St. Petersburg Museum of History, and they watched the inaugural flight of the newly formed airline. The 21-mile or 34-kilometer flight took 23 minutes, but it was not without its hiccups. First, the plane never lifted more than 50 feet or 15.2 meters above the water's surface. In fact, most of the time it was a lot less than that. More significantly, the engine chain slipped off of the propeller shaft and Tony Janis had to set the plane down on the water. Both pilot and passenger had to roll up their sleeves and fix the engine so they could complete the flight. The next day, May Peabody of Dubuque, Iowa became the first woman to take a commercial flight. The cost on the airline for a one-way ticket was $5 or about $122 today and they sold out 16 weeks of flights almost immediately. In fact, it was so successful that a second plane was added, piloted by Tony Janis' brother Roger, and they extended some of the flights to Sarasota. The St. Petersburg-Tampa airboat line continued operation until May 5th. During the four months that the airline was in business, they made 172 flights carrying a total of 1,205 passengers. 86% of the scheduled flights were completed with an estimated 90% of the flights paid for. Service ended due to two factors. First, all the snow bunnies headed back north for the summer and demand for the flights dropped off significantly. And since the city's funding had expired, running the airline was no longer profitable. So while the airline was dissolved, it did prove for the first time that airline service could be practical, reliable, and most importantly, safe. Sadly, nearly all those involved met untimely deaths within a short period after this historic flight. Pilot Tony Janis was killed on October 12, 1916 while training two Russian pilots and crashing into the Black Sea. His brother Roger was killed while flying an air patrol over France on September 4, 1918. An airplane designer, Benoit, died on June 14, 1917, in a freak accident. He was stepping off of a streetcar in Sandusky, Ohio, and he struck his head against a utility pole. As for the historic plane that he designed, it didn't last much longer either. It was sold off and was destroyed after crashing into Pennsylvania's Conneaut Lake. That first passenger file succumbed to cancer at age 55 on November 1st of 1922. As for the man who thought up the idea of a commercial airline, you know, Percival Fanzler, he practiced as an engineer for multiple companies before becoming the editor of a technical journal in New York City. He died in 1937 at 56 years of age. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast using your favorite podcast application. You know, most people use iTunes. And then you'll be sure to receive future episodes as they come out. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.